Let's go ahead and bring up the OREA uh, office. Uh, if y'all would come up and get situated and make sure your mics are on. Members, we're going to try to keep the morning session be through by 1130, no later than 1145. So we're going to try to keep everyone on track as, as much as possible. So if you have a question, let's let our guests present. And then if you have questions, uh, keep your questions uh, direct and we move forward. So without any further ado, uh, Recognize Oriari. Thank you all for being with us this morning. Give your name and position as we begin. Is this, okay. My name is Dana Brim, and I'm a legislative research analyst with the Comptroller's Office of Research and Education Accountability. And this is Russell Moore. He's the director of OREA, our office. Thank you, chairs and committee members, for having us here today. You may begin. This past March, we published a report on student attendance in Tennessee, which I'm happy to be presenting to you today. For those who might be newer to the General Assembly and unfamiliar with our work, the purpose of OREA is to provide the General Assembly with objective and accurate research, evaluation, and analysis. Recent topics from our office include evaluations of the Tennessee Promise Program and Tennessee Textbook Commission, opioid prescribing patterns, and salaries for teachers and school nurses. We published the student attendance report this past March in response to legislative requests. Before we get into the report, we want to clarify that the following research is based on attendance procedures and policies prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. We administered surveys in December 2019 and January of 2020, and thus all resulting data is based upon the respondents' pre-pandemic experiences. It is important to define chronic absenteeism and truancy before we take a closer look at the study. The two terms are often used interchangeably but incorrectly, as each have different definitions and implications. Chronic absenteeism includes all absences, both excused and unexcused. A Tennessee student is chronically absent when he or she misses 10% or more of instructional days, which is about 18 days based on an 180-day calendar. Truancy includes unexcused absences only. A Tennessee student is truant if he or she accrues five unexcused absences. OREA analyzed three years of state, district, and school-level chronic absenteeism data provided by the Tennessee Department of Education. Using this data, we were able to study chronic absenteeism by grade, race, and student group. Reliable truancy data was not available, however, due in part to some complications that we will discuss later in the presentation. We conducted qualitative analysis in the form of online surveys and in-person phone or email interviews with stakeholders from all across the state. Every district attendance supervisor, public school principal, and juvenile court judge received a survey. In addition to surveys, we conducted a total of 52 interviews with representatives from 27 school districts, six juvenile courts, nine state agencies, and two nonprofit agencies. Chronic absenteeism was first included as an accounti as accountability measure on state report cards in 2018 in accordance with the Every Student Succeeds Act, which requires states to include a non-academic measure of school quality or student success in their federal education plans. Since then, state chronic absenteeism rates have remained steady, falling slightly from 13.6% for the 2016-17 school year, represented by the dark blue bar on the chart, to 13.1% for the 2018-19 school year, shown with the light blue bar on the graph. OREA found that most Tennessee school districts have chronic absenteeism rates between 10 and 19.9%, a category referred to as significant chronic absenteeism, as represented by the three bars in the middle of the chart. A large portion of districts fell into the modest category of chronic absenteeism, with rates between 5 and 9.9%, and the number of districts in this category grew over the course of the period analyzed. OREA grouped Tennessee schools by those same levels of chronic absenteeism rates. We found that most schools fell into the significant category, shown in the middle of the chart, with rates between 10 and 19.9%. A large number of schools, nearly a third, 
fell into the modest category of chronic absenteeism with rates between 5 and 9.9%. The cumulative rate of chronic absenteeism was 13.3% from 2017 through 2019. Three student groups had rates of over the state rate during this time period. On the far left of the chart, economically disadvantaged students had a chronically absent rate of over 20%, while students with disabilities had a rate of over 18%. Black and Hispanic students combined for a rate of over 15%. As seen on the far right of the chart, English learners came in under the state rate, with a chronic absenteeism rate of just over 9% for the three years analyzed. On OREA surveys, many principals stated that the families of English learners often place a high value on education because of the opportunities it affords them in America. Others cited a generally strong work ethic in the English learner population and an eagerness to assimilate into the local culture. With a chronic absenteeism rate seven percentage points higher than the overall state rate, economically disadvantaged students face clear barriers not commonly faced by their peers. On the OREA survey of principals, respondents cited several perceived reasons for the high absenteeism of these students, including transportation issues, parent or student apathy, poor nutrition, limited access to health care, and lack of basic resources such as housing and clothing. School officials shared with us a number of resources they used to address these barriers, such as offering free breakfast and utilizing their local family resource centers to secure transportation for students, meet family health needs, such as chronic lice infestation, and assist with hotel arrangements for families who need housing. Additionally, a DHS rule requires school attendance, including kindergarten, of all school-aged children who receive need-based public assistance through the state's Families First program. The benefits for approximately 1,000 students were reduced in 2018 and 2019 because they did not meet the student attendance requirements specified in rule. Students with disabilities with a chronic absenteeism rate of over 18% between 2017 and 2019 also face clear barriers to school attendance, due in large part to physical and mental limitations that make the typical school day difficult to navigate. On the OREA survey of principals, over a third of principals said that students with disabilities tend to miss more school because of chronic health issues and frequent doctor's appointments. Because chronic absenteeism includes all absences, even those excused by a doctor's note, all of these absences contribute to this group's high rate of chronic absenteeism. <clears throat> when analyzing chronic absenteeism by racial group, we found that black students, shown at the far left of the graph, had higher chronic absenteeism rates than either white or Hispanic students from 2017 through 2019. Rates for black students were relatively steady over the time period. Despite a population increase of over 9,300 students, there was a net decrease of chronic absenteeism for Hispanic students, shown on the far right of the graph. The rate for white students also decreased. The four high school grades had the highest rates of chronic absenteeism in the state, followed closely by kindergarten and eighth grade. Rates for students in grades two through five stayed under 10% for all three years. Rates steadily increased through middle school and more rapidly in high school. On average, seniors were 67% more likely to be chronically absent than third graders, who were the group least likely to be chronically absent. Over the three years analyzed, Nearly half of all chronically absent students in Tennessee were high school students, and 26% were middle schoolers. Kindergarten students accounted for over a quarter of all chronically absent elementary students. School officials told us that kindergarten students are adjusting to new schedules, unfamiliar environments, and exposure to new germs, all of which may lead to a higher number of absences. Survey respondents said that in the higher grades, some students start to miss more as they become more independent. In addition, truancy laws, including a law that revokes driver's licenses for excessively truant students, no longer apply to students who reach the age of 18, which occurs for some students during their senior year. This fact was brought up frequently to us by stakeholders, stating that once a student reaches the age of 18, there is not much they can do about a student's attendance without the weight of the law behind them. 
In 2017, the General Assembly passed a law that requires districts to implement a progressive truancy intervention plan, or PTIP, when students reach the level of truancy or five unexcused absences. The PTIP includes punitive and non-punitive measures in a tiered system, with the interventions becoming progressively more intense if earlier measures are unsuccessful. The plan requires schools and districts to maintain open communication with parents, establish attendance contracts, and refer students to counseling or other services aimed at addressing attendance problems. If all three tiers of the PTIP have been completed and a student continues to accrue unexcused absences, the truant student is referred to juvenile court, at which point judges vary in how they respond to such cases. We asked attendance supervisors if they had noticed a change in court referrals since the PTIP was first implemented in their districts. At the time of the survey, the PTIP had only been in place for one full school year. And these responses are mostly based on observations, not data. 40% of respondents said that court referrals in their districts had significantly decreased. Fewer court referrals does not always mean fewer absences, as noted in several interviews and surveys. For reasons such as scheduling conflicts, lack of manpower, and uncooperative parents, it takes time to move students through each tier. Once the school year ends, most districts restart the PTIP the next year, resetting the plan for all students. 68% of survey respondents said that the PTIP is somewhat effective at preventing future unexcused absences. The PTIP was streamlined this past spring by Public Chapter 223, which eliminated some of the re repetition of the original plan and may lessen the time it takes to move students through the tiers. When we spoke with school officials in the fall of 2019, many mentioned the same contributors to attendance issues that they see time and time again. This graph shows the percentage of respondents who rated each of these issues as common on OREA surveys. Common physical illnesses, doctor's notes, and parent notes receive the most rating of common from respondents. Because all absences, including those excused by doctor's notes, factor into chronic absenteeism rates, some districts have spoken with doctors, with area doctors, about the effects of medical issues and doctor's notes on student attendance. Most school officials told us on surveys that they had at least attempted these conversations with doctors in their districts, and about 15% said that these conversations resulted in policy changes. For example, some doctor's offices adjusted the way they issue notes so that students aren't automatically excused for a full day for a short doctor's appointment. School officials shared with us many of the tools they've used to address student attendance. On the survey, most indicated that their districts have used incentives and competitions and coordinated school health programs we also heard from districts who use closed closets, food pantries, and free breakfast, all of which address known barriers to student attendance. OREA reached several conclusions about student attendance in Tennessee over the course of this study. First of all, we found that variation in policies and practices results in the inconsistent classification of absences as excused or unexcused across the state. Policies regarding parent notes, for example, differ widely statewide. Most districts allow five to 10 parent notes for excused absences, with some restricting the reasons for the notes or varying policies by grade level. Parent notes turned in beyond the allowed amount may be classified as unexcused, which could eventually lead to truancy status. Regardless of classification, all absences are factored into chronic absenteeism rates. Variation in local policies and practices and the inconsistent classification of absences as excused or unexcused across the state makes analyzing and comparing district truancy data problematic, which prevented OREA from fully evaluating the effectiveness of the progressive truancy intervention plan. Finally, we concluded that accountability for chronic absenteeism and for truancy are different. Districts and schools are held accountable for chronic absenteeism rates, while students and parents are held accountable for truancy rates. Based on these conclusions and more, OREA devised several policy options for the General Assembly to consider. The General Assembly may wish to do the following. 
require additional reporting by districts and schools of PTIP data and other attendance related data. Clarify certain aspects of the PTIP given conclusion, given confusion on the part of some districts, schools and juvenile courts. Make certain attendance related policies more uniform for all districts and schools. Additionally, the T Tennessee Department of Education may wish to begin calculating truancy rates for districts and schools, considering local policy and practice variations. Juvenile courts may wish to adopt a uniform definition of truancy case and a more uniform method for tracking truancy cases and actions taken. Finally, school districts may wish to share best practices for addressing student attendance. All of these policy options are explained in more detail in our report. Unfortunately, I don't have time to go over every detail of our report, which was distributed to you via email this past March and is available on the OREA website. You can access the full report for an explanation of attendance laws, more survey information, in-depth analysis of chronic absenteeism data, conclusions, and policy options. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much for that r report. Very, very inclusive. Um, members, as we see, the, before the pandemic, chronic absenteeism truancy was, was an issue amongst our students and families and schools. And so now that we've had 19 months of pandemic, we thought this would be a worthy topic to look at and make sure we don't need to strengthen these laws. Before I bring up the two directors of schools we've invited to give it from their perspective, any committee member have a question of OREA? Representative Pickey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for coming today. I really appreciate that. Um, I guess one statement, then two questions afterwards. So from your conclusions, it looks like because uh, districts across the state have different policies on how they create, create, collect the truancy issues and the chronic absentee issues, is it, is it OREA's opinion that the General Assembly should probably create some kind of uniform policy across the state so that all students and all districts are treated the same so we can get better data and more uniform data? Most districts have different policies when it comes to parent notes, um, how they handle um, unexcused absences and more. And we found that this affects at least how we're able to look at truancy data because unexcused absences are not, an, unex, an unexcused absence in one district may not have been an unexcused absence in another district. And so a student, it, it's very possible for a student to be considered truant in one district and not another. And so uniform policies um, and definitions um, would at least be helpful in helping us to look at truancy as a statewide issue. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On page uh, 12 of your presentation, it talks about chronic absenteeism by racial group. Yes. Did you do any cross referencing studies to like states like Tennessee on states that are performing better academically across those, those racial lines? And was there any correlation between better, ac better academic outcomes? and lower chronic absenteeism? Did you do any studies with that? No, this report did not go into um, academic implications. Well, was this exclusively Tennessee, or did you look outside anywhere? It was exclusively Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Representative Griffey. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you for being here and your uh, work on this issue. Um, starting off from the sort of the big picture, 1,000-foot level, uh, it seems like the goal to track absenteeism is because we want our students to perform better, and there's obviously a correlation between lack of going to school and, and grade and performance. Uh, I presume um, OREA will be continuing to do the same sort of data collection evaluation going forward. If um, if the General Assembly wishes for us to continue to looking at look at this matter, it's definitely within our capability. Representative Griffey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, so would it, do you think we would be better off or better served if we're going to start doing a little bit deeper dive into the data? Can we separate, uh, because chronic absentee includes excused absences, can we, would it be beneficial for us if we had a cutoff level that tried to measure um, a student's absence that is a well-performing student 
versus absences where that absentee is impacting their performance grade level wise. Because we might have students in our data here, it appears to me, they may be chronic absentee, but they could be straight A students. They have a chronic illness mm -hmm. or something like that, and they're just over the threshold. So we're, I don't know that we're, we could be getting a little bit of a mixed picture uh, on that. And if you could just comment on that, please. As far as I can tell, you know, the, it, you definitely could have that situation where a chronically absent student may be performing well um, academically. We do not have, at least the data that was available for us with this report, we don't have the ability to cross-reference all of that. Um, that would require uh, probably more data collection on the part of um, the department and districts. Um, and it would probably um, be difficult to do that with all of the uh, data available to us, but I'm not sure. Follow up, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I understand it, and I that's why I sort of raised the question. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of wonder uh, if we if we asked uh, OREA, the Comptroller's Office, and the schools, like, look, get, let's give students that are performing well, meeting requirements, give them a uh, you know plus or minus. If they're a plus student, whatever, and could the schools assign that, and then you all track attendance, chronic absenteeism, and then match it up with students that have. Uh, not performing or versus, and students that are performing and sort of separate those mm -hmm. two uh, data points out for us. Uh, I, I kind of wonder if it might help all of us in trying to get a better, clearer picture of, you know, is, is it all students? Is, you see where I'm going with that? Yes. Um, we could definitely explore the opportunities to do that, the possibility of doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And we've got two more on the list. But while we're let me ask Director uh, Steve Starnes and Director Brent Henley of Coffee County Schools and Director of Schools in Greenville, Steve Starnes, come up and occupy the uh, the table on, on the right so y'all be y'all be ready. Representative Hakeem. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Committee and our guests. I want to apologize to everyone, but weather uh, was not conducive to getting here for me to get here on time, so I apologize. <laughs> Uh, you may have already covered this. I, I don't know, and I don't know if I'm mixing apples and oranges. But <clears throat> when we deal with best practices, uh, I think one of the things I heard you talked about a food pantry and things of that nature. Have we done any research as to what impact the home environment plays on chronic ab uh, absenteeism? Uh, with our students and you know particularly uh, those we we'll say in the inner city and and uh, who may have uh, underlying issues we in our report we did outline the the chronic absenteeism rates of the large urban districts that might help answer your question a little more um, we did when we're looking at the home environment we I believe it's on page let's see, 17 of the presentation, and I'll flip over to that. Any number of these issues you could say is a result of home environment. Um, and so we don't have it. You, you could look at it at the bigger picture and see that many of these are related to that. So even when you go so far as um, doctor's notes and parent notes, it may not be the home environment of somebody who is struggling to put food in their mouths every day, but those are still issues that are related to how the, the parents are running their, their household, if that makes sense. And so I'd say overall, you could relate most of these to the home environment. Okay. All right. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I would say 99.9% .9 would be the answer to that. Uh, Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your presentation. When we look at absenteeism, uh, is a suspension counted as absent? Yes. Okay. So have we broken out, or have you broken out in your study, your research, the number or percent of absences that are not suspensions? We did not break that out in this report. 
Um, but we did hear from several school officials who said that since out of school absence, out of school suspensions in particular, um, are counted as unexcused absences, it might make them pause before they they use that form of discipline, especially since their schools are being rated um, for chronic absenteeism, and those would also be included in those rates. Okay, I'd be very interested if you can do some research into that. Particularly because I know a few years ago there were high numbers of African American males being suspended from schools, particularly here in Metro Nashville. Uh, almost 100% of the middle school suspensions were African Americans. And the whole point was you, you can't learn if you're out of school. And I know that the classroom is oftentimes a, a difficult area because there's so much going on. Children come in with adverse childhood experiences. Teachers are trying to deliver content. And then we get to the place where sometimes, not always, but sometimes, uh, the suspension becomes the, the, re the resolution to the problem. But then you end up with a child who is out of school and doesn't get the work done because they're out of school. Then they get classified as being chronically absent. And so I'd be very interested to see if you can, uh, look at that and see, you know, pull out the numbers of students who are absent, far, sorry for playing on word, absent of uh, being suspended. Uh, and I think that may shine some light on our discipline practices in our schools. And maybe that is a option to reduce absenteeism if we can find ways to uh, implement things like restorative justice, where the child then has to engage in a process of learning how to make amends for whatever ill that they may have caused in a situation. So uh, thank you for your, for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And we just had that conversation the other day, Representative Love. And now that we're perfecting the virtual education, just because a student suspended, they should still be in a virtual classroom. The school should be, still be going on. So I think that's one thing we need to look at. I have two more, then I want to move on to our other two guests. Uh, Representative Clemens. Oh, well, you have a follow-up, Representative Love? I'm sorry. No, no, just so that I know that we had a restorative justice bill also last year. I forget who's carrying it. Uh, but that might be helpful also. We'll okay. talk about finding other means to get students, keep students in the classroom. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Clemens, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I applaud the committee for trying to get to the bottom and discover the best data, because I think with the appropriate data, we can better inform our policy decisions. So I applaud the chairman and the various subcommittee chairmen uh, to this end. And thank you for all the work you've done. And I have to give a shout out to the Comptroller's Office for the March 2021 report on this issue. For those who haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a great, um, informative read, and I applaud the Comptroller's Office on that research. And in reading that, I was, I was shocked, quite honestly, at the leeway and the breadth of the leeway that's given to local boards to form these types of things. For instance, not even defining the excused and unexcused at the state level, it was um, somewhat concerning to me. I mean, I understand that. I assume it goes back and dates back to you know, various agricultural communities needing, you know, students to work or, or various issues mm -hmm. um, that apply across the state differently. Um, I don't know that we're still facing those same challenges um, or reasons for having that disparity from county to county. Um, but do you have an opinion or do you all have an opinion as to who is best positioned to, if we wanted to have a definition of excused versus unexcused, for instance, from the top down, who, who is best positioned to do that? State Board of Education via rulemaking or, or the legislature? Just from conversations with stakeholders, we heard when, when they talked about how their local policies might differ from others, they talked about just the, the practices that they've used over the years. They found what works best for them and their particular student population, and they appreciated being able to base their policies and practices on their particular students' needs. Um, and so where that would come from at the state level, 
I'm not sure, um, but that's just what they told us about that. Okay. The, you know, the state board is to, to form these guidelines and the, the restrictions in the code use the term firm but fair. Now, as a lawyer or fellow legislators up here, you know, that's a pretty vague term, firm but fair. And so they, that expansive breadth of kind of leeway for local government seems somewhat concerning when we're really trying to nail down the exact data on the issue from various fronts, whereas, um, you know, Representative Hakeem touched on, you know, what happens outside that school is brought into that school or prevents a child from walking into that school. And so if we really want to get down at the data, it seems like it would be, as suggested, a great idea for us to put some finite definitions and stricter guidelines around how we're going to measure these types of things. So I appreciate your information to that end. And I would just encourage my fellow committee, fellow committee members to give that some thought and consideration as to whether we're best positioned to do this or the State Board of Education. Either way, I think it's important to nail some of these things down and, 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 and draw some clear boundaries. You know, when we're looking at firm but fair, is that sufficient? to to guide local boards if they're making these decisions. So I appreciate your work on this. Thanks to the Comptroller's Office and, and thanks to the committee members for this. Thanks. Representative Parkson. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I wasn't clear. Was there a correlation between income levels and the chronic absenteeism that came out in your report? Yes, economically disadvantaged students were, um, they're chronically their rate of chronic absenteeism was over 20%, which is higher than the state rate, seven okay. points higher. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And lastly, your Representative Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to, to touch on uh, the Representative Cochran's report. Um, I'm going to touch on the Representative Cochran's report. I'm going to touch on the Representative Cochran's report. I'm going to touch on the Representative Cochran's report. I'm going to touch on the Representative Cochran's report. I'm going to touch on the we can look at that. I caution on the every time we try to fix something from Nashville and say, you know what, statewide, this is this is going to be the policy. Details are missed because I don't know your community and you don't know my community. And so every time we try this top down approach, we end up coming back the next year and the next year after that trying to do little carve outs and fix it. And, and it's because you can't govern top down. And, and so well, while I think it's a good discussion to have and while we probably need to talk about, you know, what is excused and unexcused, and, and I strongly caution going forward some sort of top-down approach that does not take into account the needs of each individual community. That never works when it's tried, and so I just I, I feel like that's kind of where the discussion is leading. I'm just going to just wanted to throw that out. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good segue. Let's go to our those who have boots on the ground in our communities. Uh, Mr. Steve Starnes.